Thank you so much. And before we begin this Committee of the Whole, it is important to remember that a year ago today, the entire world witnessed the treacherous murder of George Floyd by a police officer in Minnesota. So much has happened since that infamous day. Across the country, we are seeing more and more cities change law enforcement policies and fight to hold police accountable, like we are working to do here in San Francisco. We have a continued fight for justice and social equity and a long way to go to bridge the gap between law enforcement and the communities they are to protect and serve. The same fight and passion we had after last year's killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and quite frankly, many others, is the same fight and passion we will need to obtain justice for Black people and all people of color. On this day, remember George Floyd and see the hate some people have for human beings just because of the color of their skin. That memory itself should be more than sufficient to make you say enough. This is why we have the Department of Justice recommendations and why it is so important that we institute these recommendations and other changes so that we can keep everyone safe and work better together with law enforcement. And with that said, we do have Chief Scott here today who is going to be presenting uh, and bringing up whoever he wishes. Chief Scott, thank you for being here this afternoon. And again, I do apologize at the time. Uh, today we had some healthy discussion, the first part of our meeting. Thank you, President Walton. And if I may be allowed, um, may I share my screen for the presentation? Chief, we can see your screen, sir. Thank you. So good afternoon, uh, President Walton, uh, distinguished members of the Board of Supervisors and the public. I'm going to present um, where we are on our collaborative reform initiative that started in October of 2016. And I have 20, 26 slides, I think, in total. Some of them I'll get to quickly. Uh, some of them I'll spend a little bit more time on, but I think I can do this in the time that I've been allotted. So next slide, please. As you all know, in 2016, the US DOJ outlined really a, mo a roadmap for reform for the San Francisco Police Department. That was an agreement that was asked for by the city and county of San Francisco at the time, Mayor Ed Lee, and uh, the chief of police, my predecessor, Greg, sir. And that, that reform uh, was carried through, through and to Mayor London Breed, who totally endorses and supports the reform of the San Francisco Police Department through the Collaborative Reform Initiative. Uh, next slide. As you can see, Mayor Reed also laid out her roadmap for additional reforms, which include demilitarization of the police and of the use of police officers as a response to non-criminal activity, um, a plan to address police bias and strengthen accountability and redirect funding for racial equity, which happened during last year's budget cycle in a, in a very large and significant way. Next slide, please. So here is where we were and where we are. And I'll get through this from really quickly because I'll go into detail on this. In 2016, the, the assessment was done. It was a top to bottom assessment really of everything that we do. And in 2017, we self-reported um, that we had submitted the work on 96 recommendations to the US DOJ. In September of 2017, we were notified after a change in presidential administrations that the US DOJ was no longer uh, in the collaborative reform business and they basically concluded all collaborative reform projects, including ours here in San Francisco, which caused us to reestablish a collaborative partner with the California Department of Justice which was implemented in 2018, early 2018. So the, the line you see between 2017 and 2018 really is significant, significant because that was a restart. And as you see uh, our progress over the last four years, three years anyway, you can see where we were and where we are now uh, by the number of, of recommendations that have been submitted to the California Department of Justice. As of right now, we have submitted 253 
of our 272 recommendations, which is at 93%. We believe of those, they all will be found to be in substantial compliance, but as of today, 183 of the 253 are in substantial compliance by the California DOJ. And we'll get into um, in future slides of how that break down, how that's broken down. Next slide, please. Part of um, what we needed to do to really position ourselves as a police department uh, and structure ourselves in a way that we can actually do the work that was expected of us and that we agreed to do was reorganize the police department. And in 2017, when I was appointed chief, uh, we did just that. Uh, some of the reorganization happened right away, at least with the sworn positions and other positions happened over time. But this is our current structure. And what you see in front of you, uh, the boxes that are blue, highlighted with a blue uh, square around them, was what we had prior to 2017. Uh, the two gold boxes was the reinstitution of the assistant chief positions. And then the gold boxes also indicate the professional staff, the executive level professional staff that have been brought in to support not only reform, but the demands of what we are up against in terms of helping our city be a safe city to deal with all the challenges that we have in front of us in terms of policing. So we've really restructured and that restructuring has really allowed us to be able to do what we did this year and, and really accelerate our, our rate of completion of those recommendations. Next slide, please. So here's a breakdown of the recommendations. As of today, we have 19 recommendations that are in process, progress rather, and we'll get into detail on what the plan is for those 19, but that's what we have remaining as of today. 70 have been completed to, uh, everyone's at this point satisfaction and, and I'll explain a little bit about what that means. And 183 have been found to be substantially compliant by our third party independent um, collaborative partner and that's the California Department of Justice, the Civil Rights Division. So that, when you add all that up, it totals the 272. Now I mentioned the external evaluation process and I've said this to the board before, but I'll just repeat it for those that may not have heard it. Uh, we've streamlined our processes over the last four years and where we are right now is we meet constantly with our, the consultant that has been hired on to help facilitate this work. That's Hillard Hines, consultant company that has a lot of subject matter expertise on reform and policing just in general and the California DOJ. So we have a process called pre-screening where we meet with them on a regular basis and we tell them where we are, what we've done, and they give us feedback on what needs to be done and their opinion to bring this this rec the particular recommendation to substantial compliance. That process has streamlined our ability to get the work product turned around and validated. Where before we would submit it, it would get kicked back and then we would do everything that was mentioned in the kickback. Uh, it took more time. Basically the way the MOU is structured, the California Department of Justice will review whatever we submit to them within 45 days. But how it was happening before when we kicked it, when they when they sent it back as, as not complete, uh, it restarted the clock on an additional 45 days. So now that process has been streamlined. Everything that we submitted, the 70 external uh, recommendations that are going through external va evaluation, we believe because of those conversations that we have met the measure of substantial compliance. We just need to have it officially uh, validated and that's what's happening right now. So we fully expect those, 70s, those 70 recommendations will be substantially compliant, which will give us the 253 you see to the right of your screen. Next slide. So recommendations and compliance measures. One of the things that we did after restarting with California DOJ, we actually sat down with our collaborative partners and set up compliance measures, which are very specific for each of the 272 recommendations. And, and what that does for us, it really gives us a roadmap of, of really understanding what we need to do to complete that recommendation and get it to a level of, of substantial compliance. We did not have that process when we were working with the USDOJ, which made it much harder to, to, to do the work that we're doing. This, is, this was a value add and a, and a silver lining, if you will, with our reset and restart. 
but the compliance measures, they all require documentations of the, these four things, planning, establishing policy where policy is needed, a review process, and implementation of a continuous improvement process. That last one is important because that really is where we are on the majority of the 93% of our recommendations. Now we have to make sure that we sustain the work and we continually assess what we're doing and improve. Reform is not a one-time thing. And you'll hear me say that over and over again. You hear, you've heard me say that before. We can't be satisfied with the way things are ever because things happen, needs change, expectations change, some incident will happen that nobody ever thought would happen. And it forces us to relook at what we do and be able to be adaptable and flexible enough to change directions on our policies and our protocols. That's the beauty of reform and having an infrastructure to support that type of flexibility and adaptability. And we do have that in place now. Next slide, please. Here's a breakdown of each category um, by the, the category type. There are five categories with reform. Uh, you see them on the screen. I've, I've reported on these before, but this chart, this slide tells you where we are with each of the five categories. Um, and as you can see in two of the five, we are totally complete with the work that we have submitted. Does not mean the work is done because we still have to sustain and, and be able to adapt to whatever changes that are needed to keep this department going in the direction that the public expects. But we have done the work of implementation of those recommendations. So I'll give that just a second so you can process that, but this is where we are. And if you look at in the, pro, in the uh, column in the far right, uh, those add up to the 19 that remain. Next slide. In terms of compliance measures, this is a more in detail breakdown of where we are with, with each category. As I said, every recommendation has a set of compliance measures. This slide shows you where we are in, in terms of compliance measures. So what, what this really accounts for is the work that's in progress right now. Uh, these recommendations were never done sequentially. It's not like we do number one, now we're, now we're off to number two. We're doing a lot, all this work at the same time. Some of them were more of a priority than others, but of the 19 that are remaining, we are in progress on all 19. And I'll get into more details about what, what is needed for those 19. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So here is really, really the meat of what this work is all about. It's really about not only the processes and infrastructure, it's about the outcomes. So. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about what, what those outcomes are in terms of really the, the, the linchpin, if you will, of policing is community policing. It's how we engage with the public that we serve, the people that we, we are charged with protecting and serving, uh, showing respect in all that we say and do. Safety with respect is our strategy statement. And community policing, we, the, the reform work call for a very comprehensive strategic plan for our community policing effort. That has been done and completed. And the general order that really is the guideline of community policing for the department was just recently passed by our police commission and that is now in place. And as you can see, it really focuses on the vision, values, and goals for community policing throughout the department. Our advisory forms, our data collection, surveys to get feedback, which is really, really important. So we know how we're doing uh, constantly and, and consistently, and then really promoting a mindset. And this speaks to the culture, because I know there's a lot of questions about how do we change the culture. One of the things is we have to, we have to really celebrate and reward the type of culture and mindset that we want our officers to have. And that's having a guardian mentality and a guardian mindset. Um, and we've done that through our wars program where we now have awards for crisis intervention and preventing bad outcomes rather than uh, uh, having bad outcomes. So that, that's a significant really step in the right direction for us to change the mindset and the culture and the way that it needs to be changed. Uh, the DGO, the general order also requires tracking and analysis of community policing data and oversight committees for review and working in partnership which is really important with communities that we serve, all communities that we serve. Next slide. 
The other outcome is recruitment, hiring, and personnel practices. Really, the future of this work in our department is largely dependent on who we hire. What types of officers are we bringing into the San Francisco Police Department? Are we bringing in officers with the right mindset? Are we bringing in officers that we vetted uh, whether they have a propensity for biased behavior, which we don't want to bring in officers who have a propensity for biased behavior? Are we bringing in the diversity that represents our city and allows us to police this, this, this city in a way that there's understanding and perspective of the, the, the people that, that we have to work with and for being our community members. And what you see here is really how the command staff has ebbed and flowed in terms of diversity over the, the last five years. Uh, diversity has increased across the board with our command staff. And we go to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit more about our hiring and who we're bringing into our academy. As you can see, we have shifted dramatically with the look of this police department from 2007 until today. Uh, as you can see in 2007, 54% of the recruits entering the police academy were, were white. Uh, and you can see the breakdown of the rest of the, the population in terms of demographics, racial, racial breakdowns. As you see in 2020, that has changed significantly. And I think that's something that to be proud of We've had some outcomes that are positive. We are not where we need to be in terms of the work that is still on the table in terms of us moving forward to be a bias-free police department. Uh, I know a lot of time has been spent in front of this board uh, talking about how we are going to impact and address the disparities that we see in policing our city, particularly among the Black African American population and the number of stops, the number of searches, use of forces, and, and those types of issues that are still out of proportion, no matter how you look at it. We think that, not think, we know that we put in some measures in place that will help us get to a better place there. The policies that you see are all recent revisions that will help us get to a better place. We have really good policy revisions on our detentions, um, on our bias-free policing that was passed by our police commission, prohibiting discrimination and harassment. And those policies are the start. Now we have to make sure that our officers understand the policies, that we abide by the policies, and that is part of what will get us to a better place. Also, we have a bias-free policing strategic plan that we recently, within the last couple of months, just finalized and, and have put that in place. We have implemented a review system to really get down in the weeds it, as an internal management tool to review the, the disparities, uh, when there are disparities on who we stop, or why we stop them, and those type of things that will help move this work forward in a positive way. And then there's our ongoing implicit bias training, which we really accelerated and stepped up. Now we have a cloud-based uh, system that we just implemented uh, through a company called Bias Sync, and we believe that that's going to do a lot in terms of lifting up our implicit bias training in a way that's, that's measurable because that it's a two year training cycle. It's not just a one time training cycle. And there's little micro trainings that all of our personnel across the department have to do along the way to really give us an indication of whether we're, we're meeting the mark in terms of number one, recognizing what biases we have and then making sure that we don't uh, use those biases in our, in our work and the way we police our city. Next slide, please. So here are some of the outcomes. As I said, there are some things that to, to, to be pleased with, but we are not there yet. And please hear me clearly on that. We understand that we have a long way to go in terms of turning this narrative around, but there are some, some good, good pieces of uh, information there, data, that, that indicate that we are going in the right direction. The, the slope that I wanna point out is really the trend line when it comes to uh, per capita stops, and that blue line is African Americans, which is still disproportionate in terms of the other races, but 
in terms of the rate of decrease, our stocks have decreased in that area at, at, a, at an accelerated place and it far outpaces any other rates of, of change for any of the other demographics. That's a good thing. Now, it, it, uh, again, let me be clear. It's not saying that problem solved, but that's a good thing. And so that's a step in the right direction. We have to keep that going and we have to flatten out those disparities. So we believe that our policies have helped us do that. We believe number one, that awareness of the fact that we have a problem and accepting the fact that we have a problem is, is step one. And we've done that as an organization. And now we were working to change the narrative on that. Next slide, please. Same thing on searches. As you can see, the rate of uh, decrease on the search per capita has decreased more in, in the category of Black, African American than any other uh, demographic. And again, a step in the right direction. Next slide. And then here is use of force, which is the same thing here. There's still some uh, disparities. There's still some disproportionate when you look at per capita. When you look, I don't care how you look at it, it's still disproportionate. So there's still a lot of work to be done. But I, I do think I don't want to undersell the fact that we've been able to reduce force, particularly uh, force used against African Americans significantly since 2016. And we've been able to re reduce force in general significantly since 2016. So this really is a, a major step in the right direction and it's something that we hope to continue as we move forward. Next slide. Officer ball shootings. Part of what really triggered um, the need to assess our police department were a series of officer involved shootings that did not meet the public's expectations. You can see that we've done a lot of work with revising our use of force policies, with the training to make sure officers understand the policies, and with capturing the hearts and minds of our officers so they understand why we need to do this work and why we need to implement these recommendations and other recommendations. And what you see on this slide is the progress in that area, better outcomes, less officer-involved shootings. You know, we had a stretch where we went 18, over 18 months where we didn't have a shooting and nobody could remember in their memory when we had done that. Uh, that's a step in the right direction. You know, our, our goal is to reduce them all together to their, their zeros and those zeros are sustained. Uh, but in the event that we do have one, we wanna make sure that we handle those incidents with, uh, with transparency, that we take care of our, our, our faults in a way that the public understands what those faults are and we understand what those faults are and we move forward and not uh, have the same bad outcomes twice. So that is our goal and we've done tremendous work and have tremendous outcomes to show that are good and positive in this regard. And this slide shows, you know, wh where we are there. Uh, we're, we're as low as we, we've been in the last 21 years in terms of the average number of use of forces per year uh, using this three year rolling average. Next slide, please. Transformation of the SFP. Really, this is what uh, the collaborative reform initiative is all about. Um, and those areas that are really important circle the CRI that's in the middle, transparency. I just mentioned how we handle our, our use of forces and our particular officer involved shootings transparently. transparently. Um, we, we, we were among the leaders of how we do that, how we are consistently, we put out our body worn camera videos through a town hall process. And we've done that for the last four years consistently. Now you see other departments who maybe weren't doing it, they're doing it now uh, because of the need for transparency, accountability, community policing, training and policy. These are the linchpins of the work that we have to continuously take a look at, sustain what we've done, but not rest on our laurels and we have to move forward in a real way. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit on this slide about uh, the racial identity and profiling advisory board and their report, also known as the RIPA report. This effort is led by the, the California Department of Justice. It's independent of any, any, uh, anything that any of the departments that are being evaluated. All we do is report the data. Uh, the California Department of Justice highlighted that the SFPD had the largest the relative decrease in the number of racial and identity profiling complaints that from 2018 to 19, that's a positive. Uh, that means we're, we're moving in the right direction. 
And in terms of our policy, our bias policing policy, we are one of the few law enforcement agencies that really speaks to uh, bias by proxy, which drives a lot of bad outcomes. We've seen videos over and over that have gone viral of some person calling the police uh, in their local city based on their own biases, and then the officers respond and make that situation worse by not handling it appropriately. Uh, we don't want that to happen in our city. So we want officers to understand what bias by proxy is. If somebody's biased and they call the police based on their biases, slow it down, get the facts, make sure that we're, we do a thorough investigation so we can take the appropriate action. That's written in our policy. And I think you've seen examples of our police officers doing just that. And the outcomes were good outcomes based on them doing those things. Uh, next slide, please. We're, we're, what is our future in terms of this work? We want to continue and implement the remaining 19. We want to keep the eye on the 253 that we've completed. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't go backwards. And in order to do that, we really have to have this collaborative, in my opinion, and I've been doing this type of work over half of my 31 years. We need that collaborative partnership to finish the work, number one. But one thing that uh, many police departments that have gone through reform initiatives have done is they, as soon as they met the mark, they kind of dropped the ball and took their eye off the ball and they, they went backwards. We're not going to do that. We're not going to go backwards. We, we're committed to not going backwards. We're going to keep our own ball and we're going to continue to push for the things we need to do that. Right now, the California DOJ and our, our consultant Hillard Hines have helped us get to this point. We want to finish the work and we want to make sure that what we put in place doesn't go backwards so we can continue to see positive outcomes. So we're going to continue to push for this collaboration until the work is finished. Um, and that's where our future lies. As I said, we have 19 recommendations. Next slide, please. That we, we still have to, to finish and um, we want to make sure that we do that. That's what we published. Uh, pu promised the public. That's what we promised ourselves and, and we're committed to, to doing just that. Uh, sustaining and funding reform is going to be a part of that. The center of this circle is accountability, community policing, and transparency. The reason that sits in the center, those three areas, not all inclusive, but those three areas are the primary way that we continue to build trust where we need to build it, to gain trust where we don't have it, and to keep trust where we do have it is centered there. And a lot of our reform initiatives have really focused on enhancing those three things. And we need to keep that going. And we need to do that. We have to be funded. Uh, we took a significant hit in our funding last year, but to do everything that we're asked to do in the way that we're asked to do it, we have to be funded. Um, part of that funding is overtime. Part of that funding is to get the management and analytical support for all this data that the public is craving for and that every expert that we work with, academic and otherwise, has said that we need to understand what we need to do to move forward. We need to continue to hire. We have to put people in the academy. You saw what we're doing with diversity, with the new hires. Uh, we have to keep that going. And if that's the type of police department that we want, which I think it is, that's what I'm hearing from the public, we have to fund it and we have to support that work. We have to continue our civilianization uh, so we can get more officers in the field. But that means also that we have to have civilians to do the work like the analyst jobs and things like that, that we need to really uh, do what we need to do to be a 21st century policing. Um, looking to see what colleagues have questions. So nobody's on roster yet, but uh, uh, so Supervisor Stephanie. Thank you, President Walton, and thank you, Chief Scott, so much for that presentation. I just want to applaud you in your efforts and all the conversations we've had. Um, obviously, um, given this day, as President Walton um, said earlier, on um, one year anniversary of the d murder of George Floyd, it's more important than ever that we make sure that reform um, is done in the most efficient and timely manner. And I think you've shown us today, at least I think that, you know, we've come a long way and I think that's due in large part um, to your efforts. Thank you very much. 
I did want to ask you a question about data because as someone who constantly bothers you um, for data all the time and your report focused on um, data collection, on adopting a unified policy, more detailed use of um, force information, uh, disparity data, uh, incorporating that into um, our day-to-day -day review of operations or the supervisor's day-to-day -day, um, review of operations, your supervisors. Um, I am just wondering, because I think it's so important that we approach this and a lot of um, the analysis with that data. And I, I have been frustrated in trying to get data, not just from you, but from different law enforcement agencies. And in your opinion, I am wondering what kind of investments you think it's going to take um, to make those uh, changes so that we are actually meeting reform as fast as we can. Thank you for the question, Supervisor Stephanie. There are some short-term needs, um, including, uh, I'll give you specifics. Um, our, our early intervention system is, is antiquated and outdated. And now that system is an accountability tool in terms of identifying officers who have at-risk behavior and, and how we either address that, mitigate that, and, and get officers on a better path. Uh, our system, we've had it reviewed by several outside entities who don't have a dog in the fight, if you will. It, it needs to be replaced. So we're, we need that support on that technology because what that will do is allow us to pull different sources of data together and use it in a way that we really have a, a, a an effective system to let the department and its managers and supervisors know when we have officers that we need to focus on, that we need to you know redirect intervene in those types of things. That's really, really important. Um, our, our, uh, our, our, our entire reporting system will change nationwide in the next couple of years. And this is a national initi initiative to change the, the uh, uniform crime reporting system to now the national incident-based reporting system, also known as NIBRS the former system or the one that we have right now is UCR. That's gonna require some, some significant investments. Now we're in the process, we got as the board approved our use of a, of a grant from the, the federal government to get the work started, but it's not enough to really do what we need to do, which is we need a wholesale change of our records management system. Uh, at the same time, our Department of Emer Emergency Management is going through the process through the, through, uh, the Department of Technology, the City Department of Technology, of looking at the computer-aided dispatch, dispatch system. Now that's the system when callers call in that you know, tracks all the data about the, the, the calls for service and things like that. It's outdated, it needs to be updated, but these things need to happen at the same time so the systems that we put in place are integrated. That is a significant investment, but it plays into the bigger issue, uh, the justice system and the entire law enforcement community that feeds off of our justice system we have to do these upgrades. Uh, you know, we had to shut down our cable system. Um, it allows us to better analyze crime. It allows us to give, you know, you and others data in a way, you know, we've had to pull teams of investigators off of their cases to hand count certain data that has been requested. You know, for 2021 in the city and county of San Francisco, that, that, that should, I shouldn't even be having this conversation, but, but I am. Um, we, we have to do better and we can't do it unless we invest in the data and the technology rather that gives us the data to do that efficiently. Thank you, thank you Chief for that. And I'll follow up with you on that because it's something that as you know, it's some, I've um, been calling a lot on requests for data. And so I know how long it does take to compile a lot of that information. I just have one last question. Um, so through the president to you, Chief Scott, in terms of um, obviously the police department doesn't exist in a vacuum here and the reforms that you're, um, you, you're set to do, um, like I said, it's not in a vacuum and there's other things I think this pandemic has shown us um, that we have to work together. The fact that we had uh, our public school system shut down for so long, and I think Supervisor Ronan did such a great job of pointing out, you know, the disparities and what happened there. And I, you know, you and I have discussed this. These critical social services are also critical 
in addressing some of the reforms and some of your work. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas about how we can partner with different agencies and different departments to um, basically, I'm, what am I trying to say? I'm, how do we um, make clear that we need to involve other agencies at times to achieve the reforms that we're really trying to achieve? And it's based on you know conversations we've had and obviously you're set we have the doj reforms we know what the map is but like i said you don't exist in a vacuum and if there's any thoughts you have on that i would love to hear it yeah th thank you for that question that's a great question and i i have some real examples that are that are happening that are very promising and and, and many of them from from this body from the board for instance and and supervisor uh, president walton's district in d10 uh, you know we we had some challenges with you know, gun violence and, and violent crime um, that, you know, we've gotten, let me, let me start by saying, when you look at this city's progress over the last 15 years, I mean, it's, we've done a tremendous job in reducing homicides and gun-related homicides, but there's still obviously work to be done because people are still getting shot and killed, right? Uh, one of the things in, in his D10 safety plan is really pulling together all of those entities to address the root causes. And we're talking about you know, the educational system, we're talking about the public health system, we're talking about the intervention component of that to address uh, some of violence that's not driven by just random acts in the street, that's driven by longstanding beefs and things like that among networks of people that you have to have intervention and you have to be able to get to that. So. It's a really, a, a, an, I think, an excellent example of how we can get to that problem with, uh, and other supervisors have done. I just want to highlight his because that it's happening right now. And I think it, it's, it's going to help us get to exactly what you're talking about because some of these things that end up manifesting themselves by way of crime in, in, in our city are driven by underlying factors that are social issues that the police department has, you know, we, we don't have a, a the ability to impact those areas. So what we do have the ability to do though, because oftentimes we're the ones that are called, you know, in these chaotic times, we have the ability to, to get the right people in, into the conversation based on what we see. You know, we see a kid that's going down the wrong direction because the police officers have been called to his or her house or where, wherever problems are happening. And we see this pattern of, you know, the 16 year old kid who's going down the wrong way. Can we get the right people involved in that before that kid ends up in the criminal justice system, before they end up at general or worse yet, the, the county morgue? Uh, that's where we play a role because you, we're out there and we see it. So I think, you know, what we need to do and continue to do is move forward. And part of our our work with the California Partnerships for Safe Communities really pulls a lot of that work in. And, and you know, we've been working with, I think we've talked to most of the supervisors about, about this work, but that's how we're trying to do this work. You know, we got a grant from the state of California and a lot of the majority of that money is going to enhance our, our intervention efforts. So we can prevent the retaliatory shootings and prevent the need hopefully for officers to have to go to those crime scenes uh, so prevention is, is going to be the key, but we got to get everybody involved. E even, even on our, how we handle some of our mental health related calls. I mean, it, it's really nice to see SRT come to fruition and see what that grows to. It's not the only answer, but it, it helps in that it may save us uh, a lot of our call load, hopefully when this is all said and done, where we can focus on other things that are things that police officers have been trained to focus on. And that's that's really uh, that gives some light at the end of the tunnel. Like, well, the tunnel never ends. Let me let me back up. <laughs> this tunnel never ends. We always have to keep doing this work and figure out ways to do it better. But it, it shows some promise. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Supervisor Stephanie. Supervisor Peskin. Uh, thank you, President Walton, and thank you, Chief Scott. I've uh, served under quite a number of chiefs, and I have to say you have uh, really been uh, candid and honest and a breath of fresh air. Um, 
And I appreciate the fact that this department and the city have stayed focused on the 272 recommendations. And I appreciate that this Board of Supervisors has continued to bring these back. Uh, we're under no obligation to continue to hear this, but we take it seriously and you and your department do as well. Um, but I wanted to use this opportunity um, because we are on the eve of the budget uh, season um, and uh, we are acknowledging the profound changes that are happening in the department as to uh, functions that have historically been done by law enforcement that I think we all agree should be done by other functions in government, by the medical profession, um, by people who are uh, educated in the field of social welfare, and, and I think these are profound and right steps uh, in a new direction. Um, but there's also a both, I think, um, political on the one hand and staff imperative on the other around new academy classes. And so I want to drill down on that. I'm not a member of the budget committee, but I think this um, relative to the recommendations and relative to the moment that I have here is a opportunity to talk about it. And what I would like to talk about is um, what I experienced because we all see the world from where we live and I live in North Beach, Chinatown. And as you know, Chief, uh, I've been quite desirous of increasing the number of linguistically competent uh, police officers in the northeast corner of San Francisco, but it need not only be Chinatown. I mean, there are many parts of the city, the Richmond and Supervisor Chan's district, the Sunset and Supervisor Mars district, that could benefit from more linguistically competent uh, officers. <coughs> Excuse me. To that end, I want to talk about whether or not um, we can constrain academy classes to have linguistically and culturally competent members of those classes. Would you like to respond to that through the president? So let me, uh, thank you, Supervisor Peskin. Let me make sure I'm clear on your question. So the question is if we can constrain the academy classes. My question is, Mr. Uh, Chief Scott, is whether or not we can have what I want, and I think my colleagues want, which are Cantonese-speaking cops that come up through your academy cap classes. They, well, could be, yeah, yeah. they could be black cops, too. They could be folks who live in the community. Uh, they could be Spanish-speaking cops. Uh, but, I mean, can we, can we constrain those classes to those folks that we need? Yeah, well, I... I'll put this in a way, I, I don't know if I, I will say constrain the classes, but what I can say that we can do and, and we are doing, but we got to do better is recruit to need. We need to recruit to need. We, we need more Cantonese speaking officers in this police department. Uh, we need more Mandarin speaking officers in this police department. We need Tosan speaking officers in this, uh, Toysanese speaking officers in this police department. And by the way, we, we want to make that an official language uh, that that we actually get certified. Um, and we have to recruit to that. And, you know, we're in a city that's, you know, a third uh, Chinese. Uh, and so you you would hope and believe that there's a, a, a pool of talent right here in our front and backyards to recruit from. We, we have to do a better job of of getting to those folks that might be interested in this profession. Now, part of it is having a police department that people want to come in and work for, you know? And that's where these things like uh, the type of equipment that we have and the types of facilities that we have and the type of training that we offer, it matters. Um, it, it does matter when you're trying to recruit. So we need to be on top of our game there as, as a police department. But the bottom line to it is, can we recruit to need? Yes. Should we recruit to need? Yes, absolutely. And then we're doing that. You know, when when um, Captain Paul Yap for for at least a little while to he got assigned to Northern, really did a good job to to shore up some of the areas on how we were recruiting and who we were reaching out to and how we were reaching out using more social media and, and using 
you know, mechanisms that speak to that age group that, you know, that, that is coming to this work. And I think we've made some, some progress in that regard, but we, got, we have to do more. So we need to recruit the need is, is my response to you. And the need is we do need more Cantonese, Mandarin, Portuguese speaking officers in our police department because that's what our community looks like. So yes, we've done that for women. We, we, we as far as our, our gender diversity, uh, if you look at our recruitment over the last five years, we really were able to move the needle on increasing our number of women entering the academy. We have to continue to work to do the same thing for, for uh, Chinese speaking recruits. And we can, we just have to continue to focus and continue to innovate. So Chief, I just, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know the law on this, but can you actually, as the department say, we're half an, an academy class that can only be, be women? <laughs> No, um, not that the academy class is only women, but what we did, we had a concerted effort, and this was through the women in the police department, who uh, was what can we do to increase the amount of women recruits that we get through the doors? And they, you know, the women of this department had ongoing meetings with me and other command staff officers, and they came up with some, some really good ideas on improving our recruitment. And those ideas had good outcomes. So I, we can do the same thing based on the needs. You know, we've tried to recruit different demographics over time, uh, and we, we've seen that pay off. We have to be focused on this issue. So just to be clear, I don't, I don't think we, ha we can have a situation where we exclude everybody else because we have to continue to promote diversity, and, and that goes across the board. But in terms of... Of, of upping our our recruitment in one demographic or the the uh, as opposed to another, yes, we should do that, you know, because that is what keeps us in a, a world where we can meet the needs of the city. So, Chief, I know you're not a lawyer, and I'm not one either. But are you sure that we can't have a class that is only women and Cantonese speakers or one of each are you sure that that's a function of law I'm just I'm just asking I, I'm I'm ignorant and I acknowledge my ignorance no and I and I will follow up with DHR and our our, our legal folks on that I just you know I think from a, a matter of practicality I think we need to keep the diversity across the board and we can make adjustments in terms of you know, who we, we increase and enhance the outreach to. But I think we need to keep the diversity. Because one, one thing to, to think about is the long-term impacts of who we hire. Uh, you know, you, you see like a lot of the officers now that are at the tail end of their careers, a lot of our members uh, started in the, in the 90s when there was a huge increase in hiring. And so we, got, we have to be careful about what's down the road, you know, in, in terms of keeping ourselves in a position where we're balanced. You know, we meet the needs, but we, we keep balance so we don't have like a significant pool of the department all retiring at the same time. Because you're going to create this problem 30 years down the road. Is, it, does that make sense, Supervisor? It, it does. And I forget which one of my colleagues held a hearing about diversity in the PD and the Sheriff's Department, Police Department. It was a great hearing. Um, I think there are ways we can adjust. Uh, I would like to do that pronto. Um, and insofar as the mayor wants more classes, <coughs> excuse me, um, I would like to figure out how to do that appropriately. Definitely, definitely. And, and, and you know, some of the some of the reform work really caused us to focus in on this, you know, recommendations around recruiting and who we recruit, how we recruit, who's washing out and who's not. So I think we, we, we're, we're better suited because of that to make these adjustments that, that you speak of. But I'll follow up. I, the legal question, I'll have to follow up on that. I, I think but just from a management perspective, I think the, the better course of action is to have some balance and make adjustments uh, on outreach, but not to exclude any, you know, broad swath of the population because that's going to create a problem down the road. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you so much, Supervisor Peskin. Supervisor Ronan? 
Thank you. Um, I just have to say, Supervisor Peskin, I love that idea. I hear what you're saying, Chief, but I, I'd never thought about it in that way. But be, I, I know in the Portola on San Bruno, it took us a long time to get Cantonese speaking officers walking that beat. And um, we, you, we've managed to keep them, but it wasn't easy to get them. And, and we, I think it's been a stroke of luck that we've kept them. So. I never thought about having academies, um, you know, for people who speak specific languages, which is a need of the department, and might get around, uh, it might, might be legal, in other words. Um, it's an interesting question. Anyway, great idea, Supervisor Peskin. Um, never thought about that before. But I wanted to, um, first of all, congratulate you and the department on on um, some really real progress, some real meaty, meaningful progress. So congratulations. I know it's been a lot of hard work. Um, and I texted you, uh, I think it was last week, because I have just had an incredibly wonderful experience with one of your officers, Lieutenant Molina, who heads up, um, and then and um, Lieutenant Kruger before Molina, who just recently retired. And they work in the crisis intervention team. They had head up that team. And um, I, what was, and I know that they play the very, very important role of training all the officers on, on crisis intervention, which is, you know, amazing how many have been trained. And I know you're going to get the whole force trained, and that is so important. But their sophistication in crisis intervention and de-escalation, um, you know, of course, they're the trainer, so this isn't surprising, but it really was a remarkable. And the way that they approached a very, very difficult situation in, in my district uh, with so much thoughtful compassion, strategy, out-of-the-box thinking, I mean, everything, I think, that we've all imagined um, is the best of, of, of policing, of community policing. And I know that unit is very small. And I know that that is because everything's stretched and, and, and you know, we, we want to divert a lot of work uh, having to do with mental health and homelessness uh, away from your department. But I just wanted to, um, given how impressive their work is and how how much that to me represents the best of policing, I'm 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 wondering, um, does it make sense to you to increase that unit at all, um, it, it, or, or is that not the model that you think is is the best? I, I I'm just curious your thoughts about that. Well, no, it does make sense. You know, we've been somewhat limited by uh, just the demands on deployment, but but it does. And, and um, the, the deployment, they, they've never been a, you know, a large unit. And you know, we've, we've added, you know, a couple of officers here and there, and then we have a retirement or whatever, and we have to make sure that you know, the other needs of the department are being met, but it's really important work and, I, and it does make sense. Um, I do, I, I will say though, part of uh, the beauty of Lieutenant Molina and his and his team, including recently retired uh, uh, Sergeant Kruger, is they have, they have helped push that work throughout the organization and that, that mindset throughout the organization. And one of the things, you know, one of the questions that we get often is two things, you know, how, how do you know you're changing the mindset and the culture of the department? And you know, Lieutenant Molina and his, yeah, his unit is an example of how it should be done. But when you see officers do this without the CIT, you know, trainers on scene, it's really encouraging. And that work is being done across the department because of their training and, and because we we push that mindset throughout the organization. And I think it's, it's really positive to, to be able to sit here and say that. You know, uh, and, and yeah, I'd like to see them bigger to a answer your question. And there may come a time that we can do that. For instance, let's say we are able to to reapportion some of our our staffing if uh, SCRT comes into place, then we can do things like that because 
you know, we handled over, I think, 50,000 calls uh, a, a year ago. I believe it's somewhere around 50,000 of people in mental crisis. Very few of them, very few of them, it was forced ever use. I mean, a very, very small number. It's less than, less than a half of, per, of a percent. Uh, most of them, um, great outcomes. And those stories don't get told probably as much as we'd like to tell them because of the great outcomes. You don't see it on the news. Uh, but th that's happening, and it's happening not just because of Lieutenant Molina and his team. It's because we push that work through training throughout the department, and we have people like Lieutenant Molina, Sergeant Kruger, uh, Officer Carlos Manfredi, who, who take their message through the department. And they've actually expanded uh, where, where there's a component in each station that is, is kind of helps them push this work to the, to the station level. So that's encouraging, and that helps us to maybe mitigate the fact that we can't expand the unit. We have to do the best, next best thing, and that's train everybody else as best we can so they understand this work, too, and how to do it. Yeah. Well, I, anything, I, I, it's the first time that I've ever thought about expanding the unit in SFPD, and that, that says something about the how incredible the, the, their work is but um yeah i'm really i'm really interested in throughout the budget budget process um uh, of, of talking about that because I, I it gives me great calm to know that sergeant molina is the person responsible for spreading this this different change in mentality because just the way that he approaches policing is is the model, I think. Um, and, and so that is exciting in and of itself. But um, I, 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 the, he lives in breeze, working um, to, to de-escalate and end horrible crises without violence in a way that is just deeper and more sophisticated than I've ever seen before. And um, really looking to have more more leaders in the department with that depth of, 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 as you say, that mentality, that that orientation towards policing. Anyway, thank you, thank you for that. Look forward to continuing that discussion. Thank, thank you, and thank you for number one. Thank you for 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 sending the message. Thank you for highlighting that that work publicly. And I and if I could just take a second, some of the officers, other officers, I mentioned some of them, but Lily Prillinger and, and Sean Fregato. I mean, those are officers in the unit also. Our CIT work group that's you know people in the community that is that 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 has helped move this work forward. They've been they've been at this for many, many years and, and they hold us accountable uh, to moving this work forward. You know, the Department of Police Accountability is on that work group. So there's a lot of components behind the scene that's pushing this work forward, but I just want to say thanks to them too. Again, it never ends, and we as you said, we have to keep finding ways to, to spread this and, and and, and make this work uh, be throughout the department. And I think we are doing that as best we can, but I wanna thank you for for highlighting that that work. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to meeting the other officers. I haven't met them yet, but um, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Ronan. Supervisor Melgar. Uh, thank you very much, President Walton. Um, I want to start uh, by thanking you, President Walton, for centering us in this discussion. Um, and for the many, many years that I've known you, President Walton, you have always been uh, uh, just so righteous <laughs> in uh, calling attention to these issues. And it's always been about the kids. So I just want to thank you so much for that. Um, Chief Scott, I am I'm grateful for you and thank you for the presentation. It was very clear uh, and to the point uh, and I appreciate that. Um, and while I appreciate your leadership, it's also my job to <laughs> uh, you know, challenge you uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to do the things that we, we need from you. Uh, you know, I, as you know, have been, uh, I've spent many, many years of my life working with low income youth uh, in the mission. Um, and uh, the police department has a lot to make up for in that respect. You know, um, I was working there uh, when Alex Nieto um, was killed in 2014. And I can tell you there was so much, I mean, it was just waves, you know, of, of uh, shock uh, to the kids, you know, um, and, and we're still, you know, dealing with that. So 
Um, I uh, appreciate that we are on really good in, 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 in on track with uh, implementing the Department of Justice recommendation. We still have a ways to go. Uh, and for me, you know, uh, implementation of those recommendations are like the bare minimum. Um, and what I'm hoping that we will do is what you've alluded to, which is a culture change. Um, and so I specifically want to ask you, piggybacking on something that Supervisor Stephanie was asking you about, which was uh, the data. Because it's difficult, you know, it's difficult to get, it's, it's difficult to answer the community that's asking for the data the use of force um, data and you know all of the things and, and I realize that you uh, are dealing with uh, very outmoded systems um, you know and that that makes the process of gathering it difficult but on the other hand I am wondering if you could talk a little bit about how those two things connect the culture change and the data. Uh, so having been in many organizations, data is just a tool. I mean, like the databases, all those things are just tools. And what you get out of it is really like how you use them, right? I mean, a hammer is just a hammer. Like you can build a house or you can just pound things with it, right? And so what I'm worried about is like, how is the department accountable to the data that it produces? So how is it, how are the, the sort of police officers on the ground using that data, looking at the um, use of force statistics by precinct and thinking about it and, you know, implementing practices if they need more training or whatever, like how are they themselves being responsible and accountable to that data? And how are you um, sort of leading the culture change so that everyone sort of owns these uh, recommendations in like real, like, you know, in practical ways. It's not just a number that, you know, that you will present to the police commissioner to us, but that is useful for, for them, for, for your folks uh, to, to uh, assess how they're doing. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question, um, Su Supervisor Melgar. So the data, first of all, in terms of how we think, how officers think, how our, our members think, um, the data tells you what it tells you. And what it's told us is we have these disparities. Who we use force on, who we search, what we find when we search, who we stop, the types of stops, who we who we write tickets to, who we don't write tickets to. And part of this process, first and foremost, is you, you have to acknowledge what the data is telling you in a, in a real and, and really a non-defensive way. It's really easy. If I'm, like, I, I've, like I said, I've lived through police reform over half of my career, but it, it, it's really easy for an officer to say, when they see this type of data and the aggregate data, personalize it and say, but that's not me. I'm not, I'm not doing that. And that might be the case. Oftentimes it is the case, but you have to step back as an organization and say, look, folks, we have a problem here. And we all need to acknowledge that we have a problem in order for us to move forward. So that's the first step in changing culture is acknowledging that you have a problem. Oftentimes that's really hard for people to do. It's really hard for police organizations to do, but we've done that. Now, there are probably still some officers that may, may not think that way, but you know, we, we, I think the majority of this organization understands that we have to get better in that area. Then the, 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 the next piece is really all the work that we've done to really analyze why things are the way they are. And this goes straight to culture and mindset and policies. And what are we asking officers to do and how are we ask them to do it? For instance, if we have a spike of shootings in anywhere in the city, what, what are our strategies to address those shootings? Now, decades ago, most police departments, particularly in a major city, they would just flood the officer, flood the area with officers and you'd write a lot of tickets and you stop a lot of people and a lot of people go to jail for things like warrants and things like that. That's not the formula for 2021 to be successful with 
And so when you realize people's perspectives, you have more empathy. You're able to deal with these things and not take things so personally. It's important that we acknowledge our history and understand. So that's the second part. Thank you very much, um, you know, Chief Scott. I, I appreciate you and all you're doing. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Melgar. Thank you, Supervisor Melgar. Supervisor Haney. Thank you, President Walton, and thank you, Chief Scott, uh, for being here and uh, mm -hmm. for your leadership. And uh, you know, I want to commend you and and your your command staff on, on some of the progress that we've seen. Um, I, in particular, want to ask uh, a couple questions about uh, some of the uh, recommendations or the the uh, pieces uh, that are still needed to be completed. But before I did that, I did I did just want to note that. As I read it, you know, from about a year ago, there were uh, just a, just over 50 of the recommendations that were in substantial compliance, and now uh, we are at 183. That that is a a lot of uh, uh, progress in in a, in a single year. Uh, I wonder if you could sort of give us a sense of, um, you know, how uh, how how do you understand that uh, being achieved in the sense that were they reviewing these during this time or were they reviewing them quicker? Or do you do you really see that there has been that much uh, substantial progress on a lot of these things actually in the in the last year? Or did something change actually in the process because it had been moving fairly slowly before that and then over the last year, it, it looks like it just really accelerated. Yes, yeah, thank you, Supervisor Haney. Uh, I, uh, uh, several things came together. You know, I talked about the infrastructure that we put in place, getting getting the right people in and plugged into the infrastructure. Um, and, I, and I'll highlight a few things that, that I think speak to directly to your question. Uh, also, though, this is the accountability piece. You know, the police commission, the board of supervisors, the mayor, the public, uh, constantly, you know, pushing us forward on this work is moving a little too slow and we weren't satisfied with the progress. Uh, so in the midst of COVID and, and the chaos after the murder of George Floyd, we actually made some very conscious, deliberate decisions that had you know, other impacts, but we pulled our executive sponsors, which is our commanders away from their regular assignments yeah, and this happened, I think, in September of 2020. And that became their job, getting these recommendations done. And they, we, you know, here's the question, tell us what you need to be successful. Because, you know, we're done with making excuses to the public, even though some of them are legitimate. We're done with uh, coming before the commission and the board or the mayor explaining why things aren't moving. We, we had to be done with that. So we pulled five commanders off of their assignments and they had critical assignments. Some were able to do some of their work and whatever team they needed, we pulled those people offline and that's what they did full time. That is what caused us to accelerate the work. Uh, you one might ask, how come we didn't do that sooner? Well, part of it is we didn't have the infrastructure fully in place. Um, the other things that, that were put in place, like our professional staff, you know, we moved this work from a sworn position a couple years ago to a non-sworn professional staff that now runs the Strategic Management Bureau. We bought, brought in directors like Luana Preston from DHR, and now she works for the police department. We're able to cut meet and confer time to a fraction of what it used to be, which means we were able to get these policies in. You know, the California DOJ told us we're not signing you off until the policy is approved by the police commission. So that means we had to get it, get the work done. So that infrastructure helped us cut down the timelines. I mentioned the streamlining of the process, uh, even in how we approach submitting our work to the California DOJ and Hillard Hines, that helped. But the bottom line is we, we despite everything that happened in 2020, we weren't going to come back to anybody in San Francisco making an excuse as to why we didn't get the work done. We did, it just was not gonna happen. So we made the commitment 
the infrastructure came together at the right time to help us get this work move forward and really everything came together. I mean, you know, some of this was timing, but some of it was planning. Some of what we asked for in 2017 just happened this year because of the RFP process and, you know, which are good processes and having to secure contracts and things like that. Uh, but, you know, some of this work, you, people have to understand that it doesn't happen overnight because there are uh, processes in place that we have to adhere to for good reason. But that that is the answer to your question. Everything came together at the right time and we pulled people offline so they could focus on this work until we got the work done. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and I think that's important to know because, it, as you said, uh, the work, even as you complete all of these recommendations, still very much continues. And uh, we need to be able to move at this at this sort of pace, if not even faster, as it relates to reform. And so, you know, it does seem that something really, really changed in the last year. I did want to um, uh, ask about a couple that are that are still remaining uh, on the list uh, for compliance and a little more specificity. And I agree with my, my colleagues who asked about data. I see that a number of the ones still still to be addressed are related to data, but uh, notably, uh, one of the recommendations, which was actually number 1.1, um, is still on, on the list, and that's the, uh, the recommendations related to the fact that the majority of deadly use of force incidents by SFPD uh, are uh, involved persons of color. Uh, you know, and I think that, you know, this was, um, for a reason that I, I can't understand was put as a low priority, but w w there are a set of recommendations here that seem like they should get done. And this was clearly noted as the very first thing that that, that they put as a recommendation. I, I, I realize it's not necessarily an order of top priority for, for them, but um, can you speak to, to, to on that particular one, uh, how we are uh, getting to, to full compliance with uh, with the recommendations associated with deadly use of force? Yeah, I can. So part of what has to be done on that particular recommendation is we need to find an academic partner. I mean, we, we have the data, we have the cases, you know, we can do a self-analysis, but really what this calls for is finding the right academic partner and the right, you know, analysts to really look at this data to, to help us you know, discern from it how we can how we can change the narrative. Now, I will say, uh, we we are you know I, I mentioned the compliance measures that we put in place on on these recommendations. That particular one, 1.1, has five compliance measures. We we believe we based on our conversations with our consultant and uh, the California DOJ, four of the five are there. We still need that academic partner piece. We believe that we will be complete with that recommendation within, definitely within a year, hopefully within six months, uh, which is, I think, more realistic. But that's the piece that remains. You know, we've reached out to many academics and we reached out to many academic partners on this particular recommendation. We haven't found one to accept the work or the right one to accept the work anyway. So we're still, yeah, we think we might, we might have found the right one, but that's what needs to come together. Four of those five compliance measures have been done. That one still outstanding. So we will, uh, you know, we'll continue to work on there. The other thing is, you know, I spoke of the infrastructure and the need. There, there's a lot of data. A lot of these call like this one calls for data and you have to have analysts, real analysts to do the data. Here's what police departments typically do when they're short, shorthanded. They pull officers off the line. Hey, uh, Scott, you, you're good at, you got an analytical mind, so we're going to put you in this project. We, that's not, we can't do business that way anymore. I mean, that, you know, sometimes we have to by necessity, but I, I think what I keep hearing, and, and this is what I would really like to have happen, is let's let the officers be officers. Let's let them address the stuff on the streets. And, you know, there are some administrative jobs that require officers, but we need analysts. We need people to really, that's what they do. They analyze this data so we know what to make of it and we can move forward. So we've had some shortages there, you know, and we, we will continue to try to make do and make things happen and work around. But we're asking for analysts because that is what we need. And we've been short for a very long time on that side of the organization. And, and that will help us move forward. 
Thank, thank you. I, I appreciate that, and I hope that is something that we can get support on to, to complete that that first one. That is obviously of of, of, of very high importance, uh, I think, to, to all of us. Um, and I understand some of the connections to data. Um, on on, I, I was happy to see that the community strategic plan or the uh, you know the, the 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 DGL related to community policing was approved, and it's a number of the the remaining. Uh, recommendations relate to community policing um, and it says in there that we're going to be tracking community policing data creating oversight committees for review and working in, in partnership with the community um, this is something that I think is all my colleagues brought up that really is about changing the way that we do policing and and and, and really um, thinking about an overall culture change and actually I was on the uh, one of the original working groups around this which was now three or four years ago and before I was a supervisor. And uh, so I'm happy to see it come about. But what, what are you tracking in terms of demonstrating success and in, in around community policing uh, specifically? And is it change, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about foot patrols and is it changing the way that you deploy officers and how you deploy them? I mean, when we think of community policing, we, we often think about, you know, building long-term relationships and having folks from the neighborhood and the way that they police. How, how are you looking at, at that in terms of data uh, and, and what are you tracking? Yeah, it's, uh, so that's really a, 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 a really good question. So I'll give you two examples of how this plays out. You know, one of them is in your district, you know, all the work that we've done in your district in the Tenderloin area uh, and we, our deployment has ebbed and flowed and we've done, you know, the mid market foot beasts and foot beasts and throughout the Tenderloin. But here is, you know, we, we, up the our deployment somewhat to address you know some of the, the challenges in in the tenderloin but we are using the community policing strategic plan as our roadmap of how we will do business this time around it calls for a couple of things it calls for officers when they're on the fit beast they need to as much as we can do this they need to be out and be present and and this is not just in your area i know we're doing it in other areas too and i can think of several supervisors on the call that we're, we're doing this, but the Tenderloin one is significant because we specifically, when we did this deployment, uh, pulled out the community policing strategic plan and said, this is our roadmap, problem solving. You know, what are some of the challenges that don't necessarily take a police officer with a star and a, and a, and a firearm to solve, but what it does take is when you're out on your beat, and you see somebody who needs, you know, assistance and help. Can you call that entity and get them to that scene in a in a in a efficient and quick manner? Uh, that's the type of approach that we're we're using. Uh, it, it's going to take collaboration with other city entities, with nonprofits, and it's going to take community input and all those things. But the basis of this, if if you look at the community policing strategic plan, I think there's a section here: 3.1, 3.2, 4.1, 4.2. That's the crux of what we're doing. And it really gets us, we, we have to make arrests. If an officer sees in front of them, a person gets stabbed or assaulted, we expect, I, everybody expects that officer to take action and make an arrest. But some of the other types of issues where the, the wiser and more strategic thing to do is call in somebody else, even for arrestable offenses, that's how we want to approach this. So those footbeat officers stay in their areas so they're engaged with the public in a positive way. That's how this works. That's how this works the best. Uh, because when we're out there, we have less issues, number one. But if I make an arrest for shoplifting, let's say, and now I got to be out of the field and I'm supposed to be working a footbeat for the next four and a half hours doing reports and paperwork, nobody's on that footbeat. Can we do that a better way? I think we can. And that's what this community policing strategic plan and using that as a guide will, will help us chart the course to, to do this more thoughtfully in a more strategic way and keep officers in the field where we can. Because what's the point of having a foot beat if all is happening is they go out, they make an arrest as soon as they get out on their beat, and then they're out of the field for half of their shift? You know, I, I don't want anybody to confuse my words. You're not hearing your ch police chief say that we shouldn't be arresting people who are committing crimes because we should. Uh, particularly for violent crimes. What I'm saying is we got to be more thoughtful on how we do that and what 
what things that we need to do right away using our foot beat officers as opposed to calling in reinforcements to do that work so we can stay out in the field and keep our foot beats on the foot beats. Same can be said in other districts. But people are asking for foot beats, but they need to see us out there. That's the bottom line. They need to see us out there and see us out there and engage. And that prevents a lot of things from happening in the first place. So that's all about community policing. Knowing who's in your area because you have the time to spend out there getting to know who's in your area. That goes a long way. Thank you. And so it sounds like it's it's reflected in a lot of the, the training and the deployment and uh, the, the sort of overall philosophy of, uh, of policing in a particular area, a particular on foot beats. Uh, uh, I have uh, two, two last questions. One is there's a set of uh, re recommendations that are also still not completed that relate to uh, consistency, consist consistently applying procedural justice, a committee to review internal discipline, performance not institutionalized. So, um, you know, obviously a part of this is also when there are problems or people who are uh, consistently problematic on, 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 on any of these matters uh, with bias or use of force, uh, that there is a response from the department and that there's a way to, to monitor that and ensure it's happening effectively and quickly. Um, how is that a part of what has happened and, and what uh, still needs to be done to complete these, uh, these recommendations? Yeah, so um, a, a lot of work has been done on that. You know, part of this, uh, particularly in terms of procedural justice, was bringing a, a police commissioner from GPA, Department of Police Accountability, on board and in this discussion and conversation, bring members of our organization on board so we can work through issues. Now, procedural justice is all about fairness. You know, is our discipline system fair? Is it equitable? Or are you seeing disparities in our discipline system? Are certain types of demographics being disciplined more harsher than others for unexplained reasons and those type of things? That was part of the assessment, you know, the, the US DOJ assessment to look into that because that's what a lot of our members felt. And so those meetings have started to happen. Uh, again, you know, culling through the data, culling through the actual discipline, you know, for the people that have a need and right to know um, is, is on in progress and on, on, on the board. For instance, we now have a, 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 a collaborative um, partnership with DPA in terms of our disciplinary review board, where you know, the chief of staff of the police department has our team the chief of staff of DPA. And basically when we have a discipline case, it's like, what do we learn from this? Are there policy changes that need to move forward? Are there equity issues? Are there, uh, do we need to look at our policies in a different way? And that's already happening. And we've already, I think, sent uh, at least two reports to the commission with the recommendations that we have come up with through that process. That's what's gonna get us to a better place, a more procedurally just police department, more thoughtful about the impacts of our disciplinary system and, and those type of issues. So those things are in place. I think they will be refined over time as this gets going, but they're already in place and we've already seen some recommendations as a result. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, I think that's a, a very important piece of this. Last thing, la last question. You know, when, when we look at the, the data and the reality, uh, it, it's clear that the biggest issue that we face uh, in, in our city is disproportionality as it relates to black residents uh, in use of force, in, in searches, in arrests. Uh, and so there are two, two parts to this question. One is, are you finding ways or are there best practices to, to focus on that issue explicitly uh, and, and, and to bring that up explicitly, whether that's in the monitoring or training? I know we're doing it in, in, in data and such, but in, in the ways that we're integrating this into our response, are, are we looking at that and how to address that explicitly and their best practices with that? And then in connected to that, is part of it uh, thinking about ways, and you touched on this with the mental health uh, response team, ways in which there are times when the police uh, shouldn't be the ones deployed to, re to reduce interactions in general, so that as a way to, to, to reduce the searches and the arrests and all that, you're not deploying police to situations where it could escalate and become one of those things when really it requires uh, a different sorts of, sort of response. 
um, you know, situations where if you deploy the police, you may you may end up with one of these situations, uh, sometimes contributing to the to the disproportionality. Uh, but but by sending other folks out there, uh, that we are actually not only getting a more effective response, but also reducing disproportionality. Yeah, no, absolutely, and thank you for that question because that really speaks to the topic of the day: re envisioning policing and and figuring out ways to uh, where we can um, have other entities handle those calls that police officers are needed. So yeah, we have we have started on that uh, in, in a real way. And the way we've done it, uh, we, we had a, a group, a committee of, of, of SFPD, uh, not only command staff, but rank and file, and, and, and working with the, with the POA in terms of their input on this issue. And we have a whole list of different types of calls that we think could be handled by other entities. Now there's you know processes and labor processes that go along with that. We just can't give those to other departments without you know doing doing what's legally required. But we've identified those those calls, and we're working uh, through the mayor's office and with the mayor's office to try to further that conversation. Uh, uh, even calls like you know I know we have you know uh, DPT Department of uh, you know that does a lot of our parking enforcement, but we still get called to block driveways and things like that. And so a lot had to go into, you know, those discussions. We need to do it thoughtfully. I think that the BLA report spoke to some of this as well. We need to know what the impacts will be. Uh, but those those conversations have begun, you know, months ago and, and I it's I'm excited to see where they where they take us. Um, in terms of kind of more near term things, things like the SCRT I think are on the ground and real. And it's a, a major step in the right direction. But there, there are other types of, of calls, you know, wellness checks, which I think is the next phase of, of SCRT and uh, determining which calls that really do require police officers to maybe respond and which ones don't. And that has, a lot of thought has gone into that. And we're down the road on moving that forward. But there are whole other sets of calls that we believe um, we can we can do exactly what you said, and if we can move that forward, the, the records management system, uh, Supervisor Stephanie's question, which needs to be totally redone. Uh, it's a major investment. We think, think we're looking at three or four years uh, for that. We secured 5.3 million dollars of the funding necessary, but we need additional funding, 